the yeah, practice yeah. development got involved. Um, and this woman here, this fantastic woman, is one of the, the key people behind the community group that's been uh, opposing this development and running the evolution study. Um, and she's called Sarah McMichael, who couldn't be with us today, but she's done a lot on this presentation as well. residential area and it is located on two main roads, the A20 and a, a Figo road which goes down towards the South Circular down here. This is a very busy junction, it has a higher than normal rate of collisions, so much so TFLs even slowed the, traf slowed the traffic lights down and this means that there are almost permanent traffic jams in the, along these, these roads at certain times of day there is grid lock. Good luck in that on that junction. And um, there's a this is the gate as is as it is focusing in on the district shopping centre. Again, here is the here is the Tiger's Head junction. It's named for a part of business, suspicious isn't it? This is the Legate is the Legate Centre which has site. Yeah. Now here you see we have pedestrian square, which is one of the best things to come out of the 1960s architecture around here, if not the best thing. Um, you have small shops around the square. It's getting rather run down at the moment, especially over the last few years. There's been uncertainty about the leases. A lot of the shops have gone. This is the Legate Tower here. This is the common size of traffic jam. Tail back right the way down the road into the residential streets. Um, a couple of years ago, Lotion Council did the nitrous oxide tube along one of these main roads and found that the levels of pollution there were already illegal. So that is how we knew that this was already an issue. What we have noticed is there's been quite a lot of, um, of cuts really to the level, to the air pollution monitoring that was being done by the council um, with Kings doing so um, uh, even though they were coming up with they knew this was a very high pollution level um, in this area. They didn't up the air monitoring, there's just one single test tube isn't there on the junction. I'm not certain it was even on the, on the junction, I think it was outside the police station, so that was a block or so away from the junction yeah. itself. Yeah. This again, Legate, pedestrian area, open air market, which is a relatively new thing and it's been giving us some hope that we're actually going to see a development in this centre. Unfortunately, then when St Modwin started to come up, I got to this. But this shows how it's a very vibrant market area as well. It's very well used by local people. And it's the, it's the only area, this is basically the centre of, of Lee Town, and it's the only area where people can go and gather in the town off the main street. So it's the only area for markets um, and for small shops. But um, you can from see, these two here, you, you can see this is the general look. It is getting run down. And so the developer has come up with a new plan to make something happen here. Unfortunately, what wants to happen here is this. Um, the scale, as you can see, is completely towering over everything else. And very importantly, this is it. This is a plan. We are going to carpet the entire area with a supermarket, specifically an Asda. We are going to allow the Asda to have its own cafe here, taking up the last little bit of space and making sure that you can't get the little independent shops working. We are going to cut the number of independent shops to show ten, but Panning also says six. We're not sure what's happening there, not many. They're very small. And <laughs> on top of the supermarket, we're going to have a first floor car park, covering pretty much the entire town centre, first floor car park. And this is an absolutely massive site. What you're looking at here is an absolutely massive new car park. There's already one car park next door for the existing supermarket. So this is a complete loss of the whole town centre with a replica almost of the supermarket and the car park next door, but piled on top of each other. And then on top of that, 229 flats, um, none of which um, will play, and they will be facing onto one of the most polluted streets. Um, a lot of them will be very dark as well. Uh, there's no, hardly any of the medieval aspect. This is a the most promotional picture. <laughs> you can see they've got the <coughs> bunk everything into perspective to make them not look quite such tall towers. You've also got this lovely green area inside, 
which in the small print is going to be private for, private for residents, no access there. So we were hoping for a while that we might actually get a public square re replaced second, second story, which wouldn't be great, but would be something, but no. This is the replacement public space. They're playing with the figures to try and make it seem like less of a cut than it is. It's going to be massively boost. This is going to be a 16 metre width pavement. Only at one point is it 16. There's a little pinch that's 16 metres, but basically it's pavement. So all of this, this consultation that they ran gave the impression of square metres. So it gave, you know, people came along and thought, oh, lovely, this is what we wanted. We wanted our square back. You know, this, this used to be a very beautiful Victorian shopping centre, you know, with a square in the middle of the 60s architecture. Growing just a little bit, but at least there was a square. They came along and saw this and thought, great, but in fact, that's three floors up. This is basically a roof of a. <laughs> so, um, some modern tried to claim that this would somehow have a good impact on the air pollution by putting some trees three stories up, um, and that that would somehow affect what was happening down here. Which I persist in referring to as the linear public square. And again, we've got their, we've got their model here. Uh, again, you see the scale and the completely ridiculous number of cars along the roads. There are far more than that at all times. Um, what we started to look at was just what it meant to the traffic. Because so all of the residents, of course, already unhappy about what's happening in traffic and air pollution, um, and had to drive through or walk through and catch buses through this town centre. And then, if they want to go out in the evening, this is the only place they can go to spend um, an evening out or go to a restaurant. So. A similar sized supermarket we worked out takes 4,000 cars a day. Um, they've mentioned 30 lorries a day to supply the supermarket, and because TfL told them no chance when they wanted an extra e entrance on this road, it's all going to be using the current entrance of the site located here. We know from experience when the lorry turns in here, there is immediate gridlock. There are going to be 30 more a day, there are going to be 4,000 cars a day going in here up up to the first floor car park and look where the public space is and when this became clear at the consultation that so was immediately but that is where it is all going to be going in the normal place and this is where they're putting the ridiculous amount of public space they're not just giving us a broad pavement they're giving us a broad pavement next to a permanent traffic jam yes. so that is the, consulta the consultation they were claiming they were responding to concerns what they meant was they put two extra trees in the plan and then said we're responding to air pollution concerns. And this also, when they did the consultation, a lot of people were asking what's this going to mean for traffic. Unfortunately, despite scheduling the consultation themselves, St. Godwin were not able to give us the traffic consultation or the air quality assessments in time. Those were not available yet. And this was so concerning. Stay on that side of the room. Sorry. Sorry, um, don't have to go back now. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So I just wanted to make a point really, because you know, any of you involved in similar situations in your areas, um, one of the reasons why I think even though you can have an air, uh, uh, um, an, uh, an air quality um, emissions control zone, you can have an air quality management zone in your local council is, is, um, is, uh, is put in place, um, it's actually very difficult to get developers to respond um, when they're planning developments to uh, air pollution and traffic issues. And this is partly because in the UK, environmental impact assessments, which are required for large developments like this, tend to be done and commissioned directly by the developers themselves. Um, whereas uh, elsewhere, you, particularly Northern Europe, your planning system ensures that uh, impact, environmental impact assessments are commissioned independently, so you actually get the truth. So this is one of, one of the um, weaknesses in our planning system. Is having an impact on just how well we can tackle air pollution, air quality, and traffic problems. I just wanted to make that point because I think it's, it's quite important that uh, we, we face a particular job in this country by fighting this type of thing. Sorry, we can carry on. So at that point, after the consultation, um, very important person Julie Williams again, unfortunately, couldn't make couldn't make it here today. She was the one who made sure everyone turned up at the consultation 
It was publicised by a A4 poster in the window in Newgate. She saw it, she emailed everyone she knew to turn up. We all came, we asked questions. We found a very disturbing picture with the public space and the traffic and the entrance to this site with the massive car park. And we, start, and we started asking questions to the council and organising. And there, were, there was alerting people, there were, there were meetings held in people's houses. Um, and the name that Better Lee Green was chosen, was chosen, website was set up, the email support was set up. Um, at, one, at one of these points, someone got in touch with Louise, who yeah. was <coughs> anyway, who became a Better Lee Green's campaign buddy and so, yeah, gave yeah. good yeah. advice on actually organising and setting up a profile with a name and getting something that is not just a few concerned citizens, something that is a community led grassroots organisation that is concerned about this particular development. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Sarah and Julie got in touch with me, really, and I think this is just an important point as well, if you're, if you're looking at anything yourself, is the, is the importance of getting a, a, an officially recognised community group in place. So um, I advised on that and, and on how they could actually get themselves um, recognised as a neighbourhood planning group um, or a neighbourhood forum. So, you know, the, the, the process of advertising them with getting initiation meetings in place, getting a sense of what its purpose was, developing a website, choosing a name, and so on, was very important. Because that gave this uh, amorphous kind of community group suddenly a new power. It, it, was, um, it, it had a regular network, it had a presence, an immediate presence, and it was able to have far more impact when it was responding to planning, the planning application. And it was also very useful because Louise knew about Clean Air, um, she, knew, she knew about things to do with the Silvertown site and she, 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 she suggested that as an organised group it would be possible for us to apply for funding to run a citizen science project, at which point we ended up in touch with Andrew. Great, and um, uh, someone called Marietta did, a, did the application I think and um, we were just so delighted to get support from the Clean Air Network. And, some help with this. So Andrew came down, I think, at least twice or three times and um, talked us through you know, exactly what the project was going to involve. And we made a plan. We yep. see the plan and the um, photo there. Yeah. So there's a map on the top of the dots where the diffusion tubes, the diffusion uh, monitors would go and uh, move them around until everyone was happy. Yeah, we had kept this quite close to our chests, organising people people concerned, we did make large fuss about we are going to do a citizen science project, someone mentioned tubes vanishing, we were rather afraid if the model knew what we were up to, all of our tubes <laughs> would vanish. Yeah. So uh, by word of mouth we sorted out nine people who could be present on, on, for, on the date when we were going to be putting these tubes up and then that, is, that is when we took this forward. And what was really important at that stage was trying to work out which sites to measure and getting that right, you know, making sure that the control sites, but also particularly thinking about whether we wanted to look at um, the difference between the public space, the sheltered public space, set back from traffic in the centre and um, the sites on the pavement, which were going to be the new public space. We've got a couple of sites, in fact, that were exactly 16 metres back from the road, so those from Burnham Road as it is. So those were very important ones. Those were going. Those were going to demonstrate the best possible scenario for the air quality if the, in the public space. If the plan went through, we also had the junction itself, uh, further back along the main roads from from the junction, and then, and then um, spreading out now because this area was going was going to be right next to the entrance to the supermarket car park. Happily, uh, the Sainsbury's entrance was right there, so we found we found a convenient post close enough, close enough mm -hmm. to register what happens right next to a car park as well. So that's a good comparison for what's going on there and this. It's not an action. Yeah. <laughs> so we got the test tubes in, in the post, lined up into three teams and um, you were there on the setup, weren't you? No, I wasn't there on the setup, I was right. there on the take I was so there on the, the take down. down. Both there but, anyway, but both both of those things happened uh, early early enough in the morning we hoped to escape notice. Yeah, yeah, quite if, if you can, the escape notice, shinning up the lampposts to stick tubes on them. Yeah. Um, it, it was 
again, one of Andrew's recommendations there was very important how high you put these things. People went out with step ladders and tape measures, got them two metres up, and as I said, I missed the setup. I knew it had happened. I knew these tubes were out there. I was looking to see, can I see a tube for a month? And I never saw any of them, in fact. Um, three people per team, health and safety point. Important to have enough people, you've got someone to hold the ladder. And, um, we, and also to put them the right way up because it's going to serious, seriously affect your results if they get the rain water. Yeah. And also, then the recording where they went. Yeah, very yeah. important, accurate records where they went, who put them up, two people, two people signed off, and what time they went up. After a month, uh, a slightly different group of people assembled and set, and set, and set off to, to reacquire the tubes, recording exactly what time each one came down, um, putting, putting the caps on especially tightly and <coughs> double checking, and then we sent them off to the independent lab. We were very lucky there, actually, we'd been warned because, because this was a funded project, we might have to wait. For the, for the lab to have space to fit them, but we were lucky and we got our tubes back in just a couple of weeks. So this was the results as they came back in. These are the, um, the actual figures, um, which is uh, um, showing uh, particularly on this, um, on the keystone, where is it there? On so the junction itself, 75% above the legal limit for nitrous oxide, which is what we were measuring because it is the thing that there are legal limits for at the moment. Um, Unfortunately, we weren't able to get hold of the particulate measure, particulates being real, real bad guy, but nitrous oxide and particulates were often very highly associated. So, all so that might this follow. We might do some further um, analysis. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, so please do. How detailed was the data that you got? Was it just, could, I mean, was it broken down by time? Could you see when there were peaks, or was it, is it just like one figure for like the whole month? It was, just, it was just the tubes because the tube was up there for the entire month, it was getting the aggregate. We were quite careful about when we put them up because we, we could actually got the tubes during the Christmas holidays, so we held on to them for a while and put, put them up again after everyone came back so that we got a month when the traffic was normal with, with school with school and people at work. But you don't you don't get the peaks or any, or anything. The particulate machine is more accurate, but the tubes were just a chemical reaction. Yeah, there's probably such a technical area that's something where Andrew would um, might have something to chip in on that. But yes, I think it is just that it's just a single result, isn't it, from each test tube for the moment? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. gives an average of the nitrogen dioxide level over the total period. So it is just a single figure. And then over that period when you start it and stop and it gives an average. So you don't get a graph or anything like that, you just get a single figure. But yeah. you get uh, a result at every place that you put one of these diffusion tubes. So hence you can produce a map and look at the different levels and sources, etc. And you can put them in places that are important to you in the local community. So that's quite important in valuing the results. And we did get one very important result, which was, as you see, after, after we simplified the map a little, Red is a percentage above the legal limit, green below the legal limit, and in the entire area, even in roads quite far away from the junction, we were over the limit, except right here, slap bang in the middle of our lovely sheltered pedestrian square, not to be with us much longer if someone can get their way. I mean, what's, I think what's also useful is just the way in which we were mapping the results. So you saw the figures before, which were the actual results, but then we converted them into percentages above the, um, the EU legal limits. So. That makes it really easy to understand and allows us this red green coding. And this was what originally went on the website, on the leaflets, on everything we could get hold of to try and get the message out about the air pollution situation at the district centre. I think that's a really important message. So it's all very well to get these great results back, but it's then how do you spread the word, how do you raise public awareness of it? So, you know, huge amount of work once you've managed to do that, to get it on the website, to get it out to the press. And we're just going to say a little bit about that just how we started to get um, so this is the website that eventually Green did which is constantly keeping people in touch you know people can sign up to newsletters it's links to petitions keeps them in touch with the planning application and shows all of the air pollution results there and this was our lovely press picture and that is another benefit of being an organized group with a name you can you can call the press 
and say, the group has got a photograph and we would like to give it to you with this press release. And they like to have photographs. And as you can see, we all have balloons with a bottle of green written yeah. on them. So, um, yeah. so yes, you're going to write have balloons. Have Don't have release them, because it's a bad for the environment. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know what's happened to this. Um, I think the notes came through there. Oh, anyway, so yeah. there we, okay. start, we, started to, we started to get the press coverage. There, there's another one again. And as you see, again, they, li they like groups to have names. You can get the name, in the, you can get the name in, the, in the photo. It gives you some identifiable organism to, to deal with. And having been um, quite involved in, in local politics through the Green Party, um, I know that it's really important to really target the local councillors, to target your MP um, and uh, the group wrote to Jenny Jones as well, who's got a position on the London Assembly. And all of that meant that you can get letters from representatives um, in different layers of government to help your cause, which um, they found very useful. So here's a letter from, from Jenny Jones, objecting to legate plans and talking about the, uh, all the ways in which it's against the London plan. Um, here we are, more press coverage, residents' force meeting over the Aid Centre. So this is where we had, we had meetings probably you know, up to 100, 200 people in some of them, didn't we, in general, so we yeah. really picked up. And we have the point here, uh, that there is an argument that the Aid does need development, but it is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to get a, a town centre that is fit for purpose and a supermarket, a supermarket with a car park on top. It's just going to be bad for everyone's health, it's not going to serve the community. Completely irreversible as well. Once public spaces are gone, they're gone. So, there's been a large protest press release. Uh, this, I think this is a funny one. Mm -hmm. yeah, what we need is a massive advert. Yes, this is a beautiful, ironic piece by a local blogger. Um, just what we noticed, very... however, was that all of these pieces, although looking at other aspects of development, I think all of them, in fact, did mention the air pollution as a large reason. Um, you, have, you have people saying we don't want this development all the time, but the, but the air pollution was the thing that is a definite effect. That is, that is a health risk there. That is something that is affecting everyone, even if we never should put regulation and never wants to. And that was why this became an issue. It was because, it was because people recognised that this was going to affect everybody. This was not just irrelevant, this was a danger. And that, that was, I think, what got a lot of people involved, uh, people who otherwise might have been, oh, never mind the supermarket. It is the fact that it is a concern to everyone about, about their health, that this is not just the developers doing, getting to do what they want. It is the developers hurting the community. I just, this one made me giggle. It's a shame you can't read it. I haven't got a better shot of it there. But, um yeah, there was there an ironic piece talking about how it's a wonderful development, but then it will, um, even though it's an area of pollution that will attract four guys and new cars, don't worry, it's, they're magic cars, mm. so it won't increase the air pollution. I think this is it, is that, is that you have, uh, you mean you have um, a, lot of local, a lot of local councillors genuinely believe that, they actually do think mm -hmm. that they're magic cars. We'll, we'll have flying cars in the future. We'll have electric cars in the future. This is yeah. this is just a transient model. Yeah. And that's that's what the work. Well, I think what we're up against here is, I mean, St Maudwin's obviously intentionally ran down this centre and waited until the market was right so they could de develop it. And also, to, to, they waited for a point when planning laws were so relaxed and so weak that they could absolutely cram the maximum 